Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you give me your full name and tell us where we are today? My name is Sandra Llewellyn and we are at Canolfan Llunihirion Brimberian, which used to be the old primary school in Brimberian, but now it's a community centre. And that's in the Preseli Mountains? That is in the Preseli Mountains. We're at the foot of the Preselis and with a beautiful view out through the window as we speak. Lovely. Um, so can you start by telling me a little bit about how long you've lived here for and what your first memories of this place might be? Right, well I was born on the Kilgreen Road just outside Newport in Pembrokeshire and now I'm, I've been living in Brimberian for 42 years. But it isn't as if I've moved very far away because my the home where I was brought up in is only about four miles away. So I've known this area all my life. My grandparents uh, lived just over the hill. Um, both sets of grandparents also lived locally. So Brimberian is quite... Um, known to me really since childhood even though I've only lived here myself for 42 years. So. Great. Um, so how would you perhaps describe this area to somebody that hasn't been here before? What's it like in Brimberia? Well it's a beautiful place to live. Um, I wouldn't live anywhere else. We've got the Priscelli Hills all around really. Um, Brimberia is, is is basically at the foothills of the Priscelli's and where I live I can walk just over the main road and we're on the on the moor. Um, beautiful views, um, biodiversity, um, there's plenty of sheep on the hillsides because it's a um, big farming community here. Um, yeah it's it's somewhere that um, you can relax and the pace of life is slower um, so it's it's a, an idyllic place to live, really. So can you tell me perhaps a little bit about uh, what this area was like uh, when you were growing up? Uh, maybe some of the important local people, kind of work that people did, occupations, mm. and some of the social activities, perhaps? Mm. Well, um, because I lived... On the Kilgreen Road, which, as I said, is, on, is not far away. So I feel that that still is part of the Priscelli, is because my playground as, as a child was um, Cadningley, the moor on Cadningley, which is just behind the house. So it, I feel it's if I've always lived in, in the locality. And the, the pace of life was much slower. I'm, I'm 60, what am I? 67. So the pace of life in, in this area as I was growing up, much slower. Uh, I can remember my neighbour, who was a farmer, he used to um, milk about 10 cows. And it was a, a, obviously a, um, an event morning and evening for him to walk the cows past our house as it happens and back to, to milk. So it, it was a, a time where people had more... Uh, time to chat really and and that's what I think is missing in society now that people don't walk and they don't so they don't meet their neighbours mm -hmm. everybody's in their car I mean I try to walk as much as possible and um, you know I, I've, I've walked up here today and I've seen three people so it's taken me possibly twice as long to walk up here um, but that was one thing I, I, I remember quite clearly and another thing that springs to mind uh, as a child, um, I remember going to next door to get milk and my parents used to send me up. I mean, it was only about, well, I don't know, 30, 40 yards away. It wasn't far, but um, they used to give me, I used to take a little basket with me and um, the guy, the farmer then used to give me the bottle of milk and he used to wrap it round and, and tie it in my little basket just in case oh. I fell on my way home with a, with a milk bottle. That is something that's quite quite special really and something that I think my children certainly haven't experienced because, mm. because I'm that much older and people did sell their, their um, milk from, from the farm without it being pasteurised or anything. I mean, I know it's quite fashionable now to 
to it's buy. It's come back in a way now, yes, hasn't it? Yes, Which certainly. It yeah. is great. But in those days, you just had it straight from the milk, uh, from the cow. So um, it, it, it was it was an idyllic way of uh, the, the way I was brought up, really. And, and as I said, the, um, uh, Cadling Lee was my playground. We used to go up and play cowboys and Indians up in the... Because there were uh, quite a few. There were about five or six children about the same age uh, as me living uh, in the sort of on the Kilgwyn Road so mm. that was our playground really which is you know it is different for children now I can't see any child going out on the more playing as we we played around Cadlingley. No they're probably on their phones or something. Yeah probably <laughs> probably <laughs> yes. So what about perhaps what, what sort of work did people do then mainly agriculture? Agriculture everybody on on that road really were Oh, there were pre some people, some men then, because in those days the women were stay at home with us. Um, but there were two people who lived, who worked in Tracoon, was which was the ammunition factory. So it was coming to an end, as you know. So I'm talking about the sixties now. Um, so that was you know, obviously come to an end. But there were some people still working in Tracoon. But really, um, other people were, were were farmers. You know, my my grandparents, both my sets of grandparents were farmers. Um, one grandfather actually worked in Tracoon as well as farming. So he he cycled through Cumguine, um, each day after milking in the morning to Tracoon, and then he would cycle back. And uh, I mean, my grandmother did help with the with the milking as well. But um, yeah. yeah, he 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 had two jobs but really yeah the farming that this is this is a farming community and it's and it still is really it still is but but lots of houses have been and farms have been you know sold off mm. and separated so that you've got the land being bought up by established farmers and then the property the actual house being sold to people who have moved into the area so this area now that I'm in you know, Brimberia and, and the surrounding areas we're talking about Kilgwyn as well it it is very different now to what I when I was a child I mean I knew everyone on on the road where from Newport up to Brimberia and probably I knew everybody on the road whereas now people come and go quicker I mean you know they, they stay you maybe try your best to get to know them though, don't Ooh, you? I, I, I get to know people <laughs> <laughs> I think it's my business to know to get to know who's who's living in my locality you know you want to know who your visit your neighbors are I think it's important that this is what makes a community I think mm. if you if you don't if you see people in in walking in the area I mean I usually stop and say um have you come far or <laughs> do you live locally <laughs> But I, I think that's what the community is, is getting to know people in your in your area. I think it's important. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, social activities. What sort of social activities took place then, apart from perhaps playing on the moor? Well, um, right, OK, social activities. I can't say there were... Uh, the chapel for me, you, you know, and my family was a very important social event, really. I mean, we normally went to Sunday school every Sunday and we would go with my parents and into the services. And then there would be the uh, annual um, Kamambagami, which is a singing festival, and then at, at Easter. And then there would be the um, Punk, then, which is a, another festival, which is... Um, more or less. I mean, I think they do it in Slandisil, but it's unique to this area where you chant pieces out of the Bible, which is, um, you either love it or loathe it. I think it's a bit like Marmite, really. I mean, I I find it interesting because we are still keeping that tradition going. And I, for me, I think it's important to keep these Welsh traditions going. Um, my children hated it. Uh, they don't go to chapel or any, anymore anyway. But they, I think it is important that we keep this tradition going because once it's lost, it's lost. Mm. And with COVID, you know, it, COVID, we, we didn't have the punk or, or the singing festival, uh, obviously. But, you know, it, it is something that has come back. But, but then again, you know, very few people um, 
attend because it's it isn't up to you know not everybody likes chanting pieces out of the bible but it, it is something that it is important for this area i think mm. uh, but outside outside school when i was in school there, there was ha there were no real activities not like now where you have well, well there wasn't a swimming pool when i was a mm. child anyway um so that you know that you made your own entertainment really um in this area now at, at the moment you know we've got this con beautiful canal van and you know we, we're sort of trying to hold different activities which would interest you know the you know all ages if possible but um and uh, you my children they, i mean they were went to rugby so they would go to Crimeach as opposed to there was nothing local more local mm -hmm. than Crimeach then or, or Newport at, at one time as well so but for me personally mm -hmm. I mean there's plenty of plenty of things going on now plenty, yes. of, plenty of activities but as, as a child there were very few out, out of school activities and perhaps you didn't travel as far to go to things perhaps no i mean we were lucky that we had a car when i was a child i mean a lot of farmers they probably had a van and you know even though you weren't supposed to possibly put the children in the back of the van and, and drive but you you well, you you, you, <laughs> you never you never did but it wasn't it wasn't as if i don't feel at all that i was neglected or missed out on anything at all no. um you know, but but that in that was in my specific area, which was the Kilbyn Road. Maybe things were different in Crimeach or even for non Grois Coswell, but there was a an Eros um Aeloid or Eros there, which um we didn't have in, in Newport. Because Newport was quite was quite anglicised even when I was a child. Yeah. 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 And uh, of course, you know that you've got the problem now of, of lots of second homes um mm. and holiday holiday homes as well and airbnbs um which which is another problem really isn't it mm. Mm. so what were the sort of big local celebrations and events then um you must have been some of those uh, right you know, steadfords or something like that perhaps or any fairs or well uh, for me the big lo lo um, event i don't know we, we, on New Year's Day, we used to go out um, to sing at uh, people's homes, uh, and it was and you were going for Kalenig. I was I don't know if it, whether there's an English word for Kalenig. I don't think there is Kalenig. So as children, we used to start at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, this is the first of January, and we'd go singing to. All, all the all the local neighbor neighbors in the Kilguin in the Kilguin area. We used to go. Yeah, we used to. I don't know how many houses we probably went to about twenty houses, thirty houses, twenty thirty houses. We used to walk. We we used to walk. And we, they we were did, further away. Further away. Yeah. What we did was what went from our home towards Newport because we knew a lot of people that, on that road. We used to call all the houses because we we knew everybody anyway. And then we 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 stop we we got home and and stopped for a, a cup of tea or coffee or a hot drink because it was normally very cold on the first of January mm -hmm. maybe even snowing, and then it was a tradition that we ca carry on going then to to my grandparents parents at uh, Kilguin Farm, and then we all used to congregate there all the family, and we used to have a a, a big meal then a big sort of Christmas dinner mm -hmm. type thing uh, at about what three o'clock something wow. like that but as long as we you know and, and and it was it was a really good payday for us because we were three children and you know going back to the 60s you're going back to 60 yeah from say 60 to 66 67 mm -hmm. maybe um and we would we would probably i say earn we were given <laughs> um at least six seven pounds each wow. which was a lot of money in those days so you know you're talking about six uh, six eight twenty 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 five pounds that was your pocket money for the pocket, year yeah it was a lot of money it was a lot of money and it was good <laughs> fun and it was going to places where you wouldn't normally go i remember going down to brustier maur where um the old lady lived 
and uh, and I was, it was it used to scare me silly to go in there because it was so dark. There was no electricity. Wow. There was a big shimmer vowel there, and she was sitting by the fireside, and she was all dressed in black, and it was really oh quite gosh. scary. It was quite scary. Was she expecting you then? She was expecting, and they they they, 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 they always they, did. They yeah. always did. I mean, they they expected us to to come. They were waiting for us to come. And then we used to call, you know, that we used to call then with my other grandparents, which was with Bach on the way as well. So, and my grandmother always used to want to see a boy. The first, you know, she she didn't want to see us girls first. But luckily, we had a brother, so <laughs> so he was pushed in for, in in the door before my sister and I got the to boys see boys first. Boys first, because it brought them good luck apparently oh, to see a boy goodness. first. Of, yeah. So if there wasn't a boy in the family, they were very unlucky. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I don't know what that says about modern society. It wouldn't yeah, exactly. be allowed now. No, it wouldn't be allowed now. No, I don't know what, where that tradition, whether it was my mother's tradition or what. I don't know. It's interesting so, anyway to yeah. think about, isn't it? Yeah. The house, the things have changed. You wouldn't get away with that these days, would you? Even saying that. No, you say you're a misogynist or something, probably. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. Well, that must have come from somewhere, though. Must yes, have, yeah, know? yeah. Yeah, interesting. And at the, I mean, you you say you mentioned Easter Wood. I I mean, it wasn't. Um, we had a school Easter Wood, but that was it really. But because I think Newport School at that time again, I, I'm saying it was so anglicised. Um, we didn't really celebrate the Easter Wood maybe as we should have. You know, possibly Crimich Primary School. Did have an nice Easter board uh, the uh, first. So March. was that your primary school then? Newport. Newport. Newport depends. Yeah, yeah. And was that Welsh speaking or was it? Well, it was no, it was bilingual really. I think I tried to remember whether I was taught through the medium of English or Welsh, but at the at the beginning, stand, uh, the Babanod, which is the you know, Babanod is. Uh, the, the, um, children preschool to pre well not five year olds yes. as you went into yeah that they they would be segregated you see you'd have an English class children who came from English speaking families mm -hmm. and then and then us where well, we were Welsh speaking families so we were segregated up to standards again in standard one and standard two so Welsh and English separate and then in standard three we were all thrown in together and then standard four. So I think up until standard three, three we were taught through the medium of Welsh, because we were segregated. And then come come standard three, then we were all we were taught through the medium of English, um, which didn't seem I can't remember it being a problem because we we were brought up with two languages anyway. Somehow I don't know why because all my family are Welsh speaking. So but you do pick English up quite quickly, I think. Well, it's in the but it has yeah. become in the media and so on yeah. across time, isn't it? Yeah. So it's yeah. it's a production, I suppose. Yeah, and yeah, the the headmaster was quite e even though he was Welsh speaking, he was quite anglicised really. So it, we we were yeah we we didn't really get the Welsh vibe as much as I would looking back at my education, I would have liked to have have had more Welsh influence in my primary school years, mm. um, which I think I've, um, you know, I've missed out on, I think. And because I, I think it, it was because of who the teachers were and what, what their um, school of thought was, because I, I don't think there were so many rules and regulations about no. the um, curriculum or anything in those days. So. And I don't think there was a, there's no sort of, um, they weren't a certified Welsh only school or anything like no, that. No, like, no, like no, 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 it was just, uh, no, it was, it was very casual, looking back at it, it was very casual compared to what uh, primary school education is now. Mm. Yeah, mm. definitely, so, but uh, any other, I mean, I, you asked about any other events, so again, you know, you're talking about the Kaman then with the, with the, with the uh, chapel, I mean, yeah, and the Christmas Christmas the chapel was very Welsh. Yes, it was all Welsh. Way. Yes, yeah, yes. all Welsh. No, we we didn't. Yeah, ev yeah, everything was done in Welsh. So, as it is now, really, you know, that not much has changed. There, is it? No, no. 
I mean, if if there were if if the whoever's taking the service knew that there were English speaking people there, they would welcome them in in English. But if they, you know, if they chose chose to come, it was a, it, it's a well it's a Welsh sermon, so yeah, yeah. and everything would be in in through the medium of Welsh. So, is the command Vagani was that a, an event that you enjoyed? Yes, I did enjoy it. Yeah, I, it, it's it's amazing how. I was thinking the other day actually about um, you're singing in a chapel and, and you know all the hymns and I, I started thinking about well how do I know all these hymns how do I know I mean I can't remember the words offhand but the words of, I can't remember the words of the, of the hymns but I know the, the tune and you 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 know the tune because you've heard it since you were about well five six when mm. you used to go to chapel and you don't learn them you just you just hear them continuously or hear them often and you know the tune and the fact that you do learn um new tunes then through the kamambagani so i i quite like singing and i like listening to singing so um yeah it, it was quite an important and also it was an important event because you used to have a new uh, new dress or whatever oh. for kamambagani and if you were really lucky you had a, another new dress for punk as well so we weren't always lucky in getting two new dresses sometimes you had to wear the same one for both <laughs> events yeah and that, and in those days you used to have your sunday best you know you you didn't wear that dress to anywhere else except for well sunday school or or maybe if there was a party or whatever so you you know the clothes were very you know you there's, a, to, there's a big thing to oh be yes as well yes oh yes it was important that you you had something new for Kamavagani. and yeah. what did sort of the other members of the congregation and so on what were they wearing normally were they suited up or oh yes yeah. yes and the, the, the women in those days i would say in the 60s they all had hats as well wow. they would wear hats to the Kamavagani and possibly to the punk yeah to the punk as well because it was that was quite a, a, a big you know festival really um yeah the, the, yeah i and remember my mother you know yeah my mother always used to wear a hat to to chapel so yeah you yeah. wouldn't think about it now perhaps no. it would be no, apart from obviously a wedding a wedding so yeah but no it was uh it was the damn thing to wear a hat to chapel which you forget about really until you're talking about it now no, it's interesting yeah. though, isn't it? Yeah. To think about, you know, someone getting that dressed up. So, yeah, to go to chapel. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um so going back to school then, is there anything that stands out for you perhaps from your school days? Any sort of standout memories? Or oh, how cruel one of the teachers was. Really? Oh they were. That I mean one particular one was I mean uh, we were talking about it this morning actually, and um yeah she they they just wouldn't get away with it now she would be probably in prison for abusing children because mm -hmm. one teacher used to pinch pinch us on our arms really? yeah if, if we didn't do what what she wanted us to do and another thing she used to do and she made me do it once was work out a long division sum on the blackboard in front of everybody and I, I can remember it so clearly because I just went completely blank. I, I, just, I just didn't know. Well, you know, you wouldn't have teachers doing that these days. Well, it's humiliating, I suppose. So mm -hmm. humiliating and not helpful at all. I mean, you weren't going to learn anything by, um, by doing a long division in front of your, your friends. <laughs> you could, and I couldn't do it anyway. So, uh, but anyway, that was one thing that I remember. And yeah, she, this particular teacher was renowned for being really horrible to, so, you know, she used to pick on people, mm -hmm. talking about being, you know, victimised at school, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I was victimised by it, I felt. Um, my brother was as well. My sister then, she adored her, you know, which was completely a different kettle mm -hmm. of fish. Um, and another thing I, I remember about the school, the, the headmaster then, he um, he was into sailing. So in Standard 4, um, we we followed the Queen round her um, visit to the to the um, Caribbean islands because she was sailing around the Caribbean islands. And we also followed Val Howells on his journey across the Atlantic in a 
single-handed. I can't remember much about the party then, but, but you know, they used to, I think those days, they used to choose what they wanted to teach the children and he was into sailing. So we had a lot of things linked to the sea. So that was his interest. So it was your interest yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, no, that, that was, you know, that's where the, the curriculum is a good thing, isn't it? So that everybody is yes. given this basis. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go off on a tangent about no. Val Howells and his sailing no. expeditions. So, um, yeah. So, uh, what kinds of uh, work did people from the area do? Um, uh, did a lot of people leave to go to other work in other areas, perhaps, as you were growing up? Maybe not when you were younger, but as you, you were growing up, perhaps? Um, I th um, a lot of... Uh, let's have a look now. A few people, yes, went to Cardiff. I mean, I went to Cardiff to work, for instance. So, mm. you know, once I, you know, finished college in Hafford West, I didn't go far to, col mm. to college. But um, I think it was the done thing to to move to Cardiff in those days. You're talking about then the seventies, um, and there was there was a there was a group of us from from the Kilwin area really, or Newport Kilwin area. Uh, who went to Cardiff to work. Um, some people went further afield, but it's really strange to think now the, the people I knew that from Cardiff who went around the same time as me, I think all of them have come back to live and raise their families back here. Yeah. So it really says a lot for the area. You know, I mean, that's what, what happened to me as well. Um, I was working in Cardiff, met my husband, who is again from this area, as it happened. But... Mm -hmm. Um, and we thought, well, you know, wh what are we going to do? Are we going to stay in Cardiff and make our home in Cardiff or, or come back to the Fraselli's? And yes, it was both of us said, if we're going to have a family, we want to raise them as we've been raised, mm -hmm. you know, in this locality, know, get to know your neighbours, mm -hmm. being involved in the Welshness of, of the locality as well. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel strongly about... Um, the fact that it's my responsibility as well to keep the Welshness of this area going and it's so lovely to hear that last night there was a, a group of I think 15 people who had moved into the area who have started Welsh classes here at the Ganolvan and I really feel strongly that it's our responsibility as Welsh speakers and people who have lived here all our lives to encourage the people who have moved in not only to learn the language, but to learn about our culture and about their area, about the history of, of the area, about the, about the landscape. Um, because the people who, who are um, first language web speakers are possibly diminishing in this area. Mm. And so we... I'm, I'm thinking we're, we're looking at the future for the area with people who have moved in, but they can also be part, of, um, in, in, instrumental part of, of the area, but it's up to us to encourage and help them as well. It's not, it's no way, uh, I, I don't think it's fair on people who have moved into the area to be left to their own devices. I think we need to encompass them and and be you know be a community whether they come from london spain uh hungary we've got you know we've got people from um a lots of different countries in in this area but it, it's important that we welcome them and make them feel as if they are part of the Bruselles because a lot of them are well a lot most people we, we're very lucky in this area that people are are prepared to get involved and mm. and I think this Canolvan has made a difference to, to, to from the people to um, make, make them feel that they belong somewhere mm. and that, and that's this belonging um, and because I feel very that I do belong in this area that I'm very blessed to feel the way I, I do feel and I, I think it's important that people who move into the area also feel that they belong here and it, it's our responsibility to to help with the language and the culture and then and, and to transfer the, the knowledge that we have to them great so 
thinking back then to uh, you know what kind of services facilities were there in the area of Kilgreen, as in you know with the with the businesses that don't exist anymore and and so on, possibly oh, in Bryn well, as well. Well, the yeah, there were. Um, I remember a post office in in a little house in the front room in in Kilgwyn, mm-hmm. um, near the chapel there, Penvedir. Um, so there was a post office there, and it was quite an event to go over there to get a few stamps when I was staying with my grandparents. So there was that in the Kilgwyn area as. I remember it. Then Brimberry, and of course, I mean, we moved here 42 years ago into the village, and there was a thriving shop, um, also petrol pumps. Um, a few years previous to that, they had, I think, three vans going out into the area. I mean, I remember as a child in Kilgwyn that uh, Sart, the, the, the guy who owned the uh, shop and ran the shop, used to come, you know, four miles away with with a with a van full of of goods. You know, we could go in into the van then and and it was like rigged out with tins of and cereals and fresh shops. fruit and yeah. whatever. It was like a mo- mobile shop coming mm-hmm. to, to the area. Well that's that's gone by the way. Uh, and of course the post office and the shop in and Brimberian has has left gone as well. So um and that was somewhere that I used to come when I stayed with my grandparents on Kilgreen Farm. I used to come down with my grandfather because he was the one who did the shopping. My grandmother gave him a list and then he was the one who would come down and then we'd come down with with him. Um, and yeah, it was a, a, a thriving, you know, all the mm. local people used to have their groceries from from the shop. Um, I, I did when I first came here. Um, you know, you could have fresh ham and wow. vegetables and ev- well, everything you wanted, really. So that that's a shame that's gone by the wayside. Also, then the the shop finished, the shop closed then, and well, the petrol pumps closed first, I think, and then the the shop closed. Then the post office moved to another building in the in the village. Um, then it sort of went down from five days a week to two days a week and by now it's just gone and now we've got the mobile van coming around once a week so mobile post office mobile post office yeah Mm -hmm. so so that's changed a lot because i remember when i first came to brimeria because we were opposite living opposite the um the shop i mean you used to from from the front garden you used to hear the conversations from the local farmers and you used to recognise some people by the revving of the car as they passed, and um, yeah, it it was it the the community has changed a lot since we you know we moved here in 1982, I think it was eighty two. It's it's changed a lot, mm. um, yeah. The, and by losing the shop, you just lose that connection. So to the. the because everybody needed milk or bread or whatever, so everybody used to. You that know, focal point. Then. Focal, yeah. So hopefully, you know, this this is more of a you know the canal van here now is is the focal point now. So mm-hmm. we are lucky that we've still got this. So would your own family have had an interest in you know local history at all? people and places locally? Um, no, I, um, well, they, they, they knew everybody, yes. They knew, you know, my both my parents are, are from, you know, the Kilgwyn, Brimberian area anyway. So it was, you know, everybody knew we, everybody else. Mm. You know, it was, and everybody was Welsh speaking as they grew up as well, more so obviously than when I grew mm. up. and. Um, so, so as far as history of the area is concerned, I suppose it was just what they learnt at school. My father came to school here at the Gunnulban, so and when, at, when it was a school, then. when it was a school. So and 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 the headmaster at that time was very into um, history, history of the area. I think more than you know general history, but history of the area and learning about. Um, 
you know, who just learning about the nature of the area as well. So were there any stories passed down to you from, you know, your parents or, or grandparents or any earlier generations? Ooh, um, I can't, I can't think of any, any at the moment. I, um, well, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was quite into, um, ghost stories and that sort of thing and really? he, yeah and he he said you know he was saying that he saw saw the canwyllt corf oh. um where he, he sort of said that he'd walked along this road and he could see the the preset the the um procession of the funeral, funeral procession. procession and um, and and people would were dressed in black, and he didn't recognize anybody, but he felt, you know, that there was something in the air, and there was, and I used to sort of poo poo it really. I didn't really believe what he was saying, and and then he would say, oh, and then a few days later, so and so died, and and that was, you know, a sign that there was death in the air, in 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 the locality and everything. But no, I can't I can't think of any other. There's lots of stories of these corpse candles and phantom funerals in the area. Yes, yes, it? it's yeah. interesting. So he he was the one who used to pass that pa one down. Pass one down, yeah. <laughs> and possibly wanted to frighten us more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you know of any traditions um, that you know used to be or still are practiced in the Caselli? I know you mentioned um, Kaleni. Um, yeah. Does that still happen now then? Well, no. I mean, I when when my children were were younger, I mean, they, I used to get them to go, go around a few local houses, but I I I haven't had anybody come for uh, Kalenig for several years now. I mean, mm. several years. I mean, probably ten, twelve years, which is such a shame, really, because it's such a lovely way to start off the year to see seeing young children singing and you know now you tend to have um not the halloween um what's the yes the halloween kalangayav kalangayav where you know they dress it's that's more of a an american american tradition really well i i see it but well but i think it's it's possibly based in some celtic tradition on our side as yeah. in the Kalangaya, but yes it's you know you think of pumpkin and so on yes more yeah more of a of a, an American life. it is a shame but then again you know who's to blame maybe I'm to blame you know you know why why didn't I sort of not pressurize my children into doing it but um mm. but you 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 lose so many things so quickly I think it's you you've got to work at everything. I think it's you've got to work at it. So how does Kaleni differ then from here in Galan in the in the um, Cumguain? Because obviously Cumguain isn't isn't far from here or or Kilguin no. really. It's amazing that that they celebrate that they they still keep that tradition of celebrating the New Year on the thirteenth of January when we didn't, didn't and living so close really mm. it was and it's it, a similar tradition really. yes it's just singing on a different date really yes yeah and I, I think as a child uh, well as a very young child my parents used to go to uh, Fanondiki which was quite infamous I think about their parties at on the 13th of January oh, celebrating right. um, celebrating the Hain Galan and that was my my father's uh, relatives then my father's grandfather grandparents used to live there so um and they used to celebrate they used the to celebrate year. yeah and the, and there was you know a cake there and lots of uh homebrew homebrew was quite a big thing so mm -hmm. you know everybody used to make their brew my grandfather was home make, make, made his own brew um and yeah, it's it's strange that living so close, we d we didn't we didn't celebrate on the thirteenth. Um, celebrating on the on the first. Yeah. Although the the tradition in essence is the same. Yes. It's yeah. just that it's one of you's carried on with the new calendar yeah. and the old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're more uh, advanced than. <laughs> but so the the children still go and sing in the Cumguain. Yes, they? yes, they do. Yeah, and they they go in and have 
a spread of you know the food and everything and and I, I believe that they've given money as well. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think they, they are. They've given I money. Think they have a day off school. Yes, they do. They, they, I think they close um, their uh, school in Llanoclodog, the Pine Valley. They close it for that day, yeah. which is quite amazing, really. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's good. I think it's a brilliant. Because, as I said, we, if we don't work mm. at these keeping these traditions going, they're going to go. They're going mm. to go. And we've got to work hard at it. So... What about any of the sort of uh, you know, local myths or legends locally in the Brimberian or Kilgreen area? Are there any others? No, um, no, I don't. I I can't. Bither Avanc, I suppose that's the that's the monster's grave out on the Bruselles. I mean, uh, that's quite a um, you know f- a famous. So what do you know much about it? Um, about the the, the uh, it was about the monster eating the um, eating the lambs and um, did he live under the bridge? He, I I don't know whether he lived under the bridge. Did he? Apparently, apparently he, did. he lived under the bridge. Yeah. I mean, you. I think you get a few different versions of this, don't you? So, and the, I, I think the local people got him in the end, didn't they, and buried him in the in the. Yes, yeah. there's a couple of different. Stories. I think there's yeah. one that uh, was um, uh, that he was yes a, a, a very so bit of a nuisance of a monster. Yeah. And the other okay. perhaps that he, he he wasn't so much. He was a helpful one, and it was an accidental. Oh, death. is it? Oh, right. So I haven't heard that one. I've heard of him being you know eating the lambs and being a pest, yes. and then the, the the locals got him together and and killed him. I don't know how why there was only one monster. I can tell you. <laughs> But on so on the moor there, yeah, there is remnants yeah. of, yeah. of the monster. Yeah, well, I don't know the remnants of the monster, but there's a there's a there's a it's a marked area which and I take the children take the children there, the grandchildren now, and you you know get the story going and get them to look at how big this monster was, you know, because so what does it look like? It just uh, there's just stones sort of mark the in par- parallel stones. On a very long, it's probably about ten feet long, or more, maybe more. Mm. Uh, so you could imagine how a big monster would lay between these markers, rocks. So, um, so what's it like to live here today? You mentioned a little bit about how the area has changed, um, but what's it like here to live here today? What it, you know, what what goes on here most days in Brimberia? Right. Um, well, it's, uh, I, I think it's, um, for me, it's a busy place because I am involved in the canal van and uh, I think this uh, is important for the community um, because it's the focal point now that we've lost everything else in the community. Mm. Um, it's, um, but then again, it's, it's as uh, relaxing as you want it to be because this morning I've, um, you know, I've been walking the moor this morning, for instance, you know, and, and you can walk for miles without seeing anybody. So if you've got, you know, so any stresses, you can just walk onto the moor and, and relax and, you know, have, you know, take stock of, of life in general, really. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it, it's a change. It's a changing, uh, changing place because p- so many people have moved into the area. But I think we've got to be open and welcoming, and you know we've got to try and live together. Um, and and I think that's that's important for me that we try to to live together. We, you know, we're all people trying to get the best out of life. And I, I can't blame people for leaving, say, Slough or Reading or wherever they've come from to live in a place like this. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I can't blame them for, for coming to, to live here. But how, I th- how has it affected the, the local community and population in, in that regard? Um, I, th- I think that there can be a divide. I think there can be a divide mm. um, as long, but you've got to be open minded. You know, you've got, I think people have got to be open minded about 
uh, people who who leave big cities to come and live in the country. But I, as far as I'm concerned, as long as people try and be part of the community and appreciate what uh, that they've come to a different country, different culture, different language, and I think it's important that they realise that instead of thinking that they've come to a part of England and they can speak English and they can do what you know do what they did before but they can't it's it's not it it's a different country mm. and I think people now are possibly beginning to realize more I mean I think the football the the world uh, football has has made a difference it's made people realize that there is another language here mm. you know that, and, and there is another culture um, and I and I and I, I really do think that it's um it's important that we as Welsh speaking people who have always lived here um, help people who have moved into the area to realise this and to, um, to help them appreciate what where they've come to where, mm -hmm. you know where they where where they're living now mm -hmm. I mean it's but it, as I said it's uh, it's our responsibility as well there's no there's, there's no point in in complaining possibly about all these houses being by people who have moved from into the area um, but we've got to make you know we've got to make them realize that there is a a different way of life here and that they've they've opted to come to a different way of life yeah. so how much do you feel like you identify as being part of the from the Pasali area from Pimbaria is it You've got yes. a strong cultural identity in that, in oh, that yeah. sense. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, as I, and yeah, I'm, I'm so glad I live here, and 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 it is my responsibility to um, promote the Welshness of this place as well, mm. promote and promote the area. Um, yeah, and I mean, I can't see myself living anywhere else. Do you think other people have got that strong sense of identity to the area as well? Yes, I, I I think a lot of the Welsh speaking people who whose family have always been here. Yes, they they do think that this, possibly to the extent that, um, that they think that they own the place. We don't own the place. We we are just tenants here mm. f during our lifetime, mm. but uh, it is our responsibility as tenants of of this area, to keep what's good going, and. You know whether whether that that hopefully that is in the minds and the and the um of of everybody who who lives lives in the area. So what does it mean to be from the Pasali area? As in, if you think broadly across across the area, across the mountains here, what does it mean to be from this area? I think I'm very special because I live in this area. I th yeah, I think it's. Uh, but do you think there's a kind of place identity across the area? You know, is is it a really, you know, if 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 I asked you where you where you're from, you'd say yeah. very young, But would yeah. you, you know, is Preseli an area that stands out of its own accord? Yes, because I th I think it's because it is a. In, in Pembrokeshire, I think the Preselis are a dividing line as well, even though we've got the Lanska line, which is further south in the county, where mm. there's a line of, of the Little England beyond Wales, as the south of the county is known as. But for me, I think the Preselis is, you know, north of the Preselis, where, where we are now, is, is, is special because you've got that a mountain and sea area and we're living in this sort of corridor really between the land the, 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 the mountains or the hills and the sea and I think that's a real special place mm. also I think we've got this dialect as well that we you know we're, we're, we're the the area of the waste waste I mean we were talking this morning as it happened about how I I say in in Welsh um, uh, instead of the yes, the Welsh yes for yes is ois, but because I come from this area, I would I would say ways, mm. and I think even though a lot of English uh, Welsh speaking people say, oh, you're saying that 
differently but I think it's important to keep that going as well because it's unique to this area to Blue R. Evans and his book Waste Waste where we say a lot of things differently even to you know people from Michael Hawk, which is yes. just over the mountain I mean there's so many different dialects in this area even come wine say different things yes. to, to us here in Brimberry and Kilguin area so that's Tavodieth you call that. yes the colloquial yeah yes I, and, I, and I think that's important as well and it's very difficult for people who are learning Welsh because they're hearing so many different ways of saying yes for instance but it's um, important for them then to be included in the community so that yes, they because, can learn that yes I suppose and I, th and I think when when people are learning Welsh they should be learning Welsh of the area mm -hmm. and not sort of you know going by the by the book and learning words from North Wales because it just doesn't work here no so um that's important for the Priscelli area as well so so that you, you've got the Welsh the the dialect that's um, spoken in in this in this particular area mm. so is it a heritage site locally that holds memories to you and perhaps your family heritage site no, well um, heritage site I can't um, not at Castle or Pentrevan or well, Pentrevan I suppose has always been there. I mean, I, you know, as as a child, I would go and visit Pentrevan, um, and of course now I can, you know, I can walk over there. It's a it's a lovely walk up there and back to the village. Um, Cry Cross of Elian is something very new, so I, you know, I mean, obviously I I, I do walk a lot, so I walk down to Cry Cross of Elian and round. Um, but but Pentrevan, I suppose, is is the main the main place, and of course for me, uh, I mean it's not a, a an archaeological place, but Cadningley is is very close to my heart. I mean, I it's a hill it's walk, so it's a it's well, it, yes, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, yeah. it's a, it is a site, a heritage oh, site. Right. Yeah, well that's that's my main one then, I suppose, <laughs> because because that that was where I played as a as a child you know so yes and whenever i i can i do go walking i mean obviously from the house i walk to on the mm -hmm. preselli hills here but if i walk to my if i go to my brothers for instance i would walk on to the cadmingley mm, which, is, which is really special really very it's special there, isn't it? yeah yeah it's because beautiful. again you can see all the way around and even to the wicklow mountains when you yes. when you're on a very clear day so um Cunningly is, is is my mountain for as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, so going back to Pentrevan, do you yeah. feel that's a heritage site um, that's quite important to the to the local community in the Preseli area? Well, yes, it's sort of important, but, but uh, you know, important how now listen up now. How is it important for us? Is it important because it draws people to the area? And then so that we can all um, gain from tourism in that sort of area. Um, obviously, we don't want, you know, it inundated with tourists because the, we haven't got the infra infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And also, as I said before, it's a, a farming community. So you get these big tractors and trailers and going along these lanes. So it's not really compatible with tourists who find it very difficult to reverse these round corners and things. It's a popular site for visitors though. Oh it is a popular site for the visitors and I, and and it's lovely to be able to share it as well. I mean I'm I'm not saying, you know, that we shouldn't be no. sharing it because we should be sharing our heritage and showing people, you know, how beautiful this area is. Um but uh, um but we've got to be careful I think in the future. We because you know we 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 live here we, we you know and, and farming is is, a, is an important part of the area mm. and you know you, you you've got to respect that it, it isn't a it isn't a fairground or a or a no. or a tourist site as in no. you know it's it's a living living community so what about the you know Pentrevan as a you know Pentrevan for people that are listening that don't know it's uh, it's a, a Neolithic burial chamber. Yeah. Um. But you know, you, well, it's 
the it's the symbol of, of this building. Yeah. It's used for lots of things. Is it then symbolic in that terms to the local community? It's symbolic as in I think um people might see it as part of uh further arch archaeological sites in the area. Mm -hmm. I think well they probably think, well, you know, if, if there's a, a an ancient burial ground here there must be lots of other things so i think this area in particular will attract people who are interested in archaeologic uh, archaeology mm -hmm. so it's an open to the identity then, into it? the identity yeah, of the area yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you've mentioned that you um, like to go walking often in in the Casali area where do you normally go walking where are some of your favorite spots to go for a, a walk or a, a whack maybe you'd say here yeah well my one of the favorite walks is from from the house then across the main road onto the moor and then there's a there's a a, a property called Havwood, an old well now it's a ruin but my parents can remember people actually living oh. there um so it's right on not on top of the Priscellis, but right in onto the Priscellis. That's quite a favorite. That's a favorite walk because again, you can see the sea from there. Uh, it's fairly high up. Uh, it's an easy walk as well. It's not too diff. You know, it's not too difficult. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, the the ridge itself from top of Gwent, all over, all all the way over seven miles of it through to Manachlog um, that's a, a lovely spot, lo lovely walk that I'd mm. like to do, you know, sort of on nice, clear summer day, summer's day. Um, that, that, that's another favourite walk. Um, but really, out on the moor, I mean, I've been out on the moor this morning. Um, a crowd of us went, went walking um, towards um, the site where the Becker races take place, you know, okay. but... Uh, um, so what's that? A, a, a race a, that's held over the mountain. Yes, it's a race that ha that's held every year at the end of August, and it's a hill, uh, hill race, that goes up across part of the top, the ridge of the Priscellis and back. And it's quite, um, it's Have quite. Have you run it before? Oh, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've walked it. I've yes. I've, I've walked the 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 uh, the route. The route, but um, no, no, no racing involved. And then again, as I said, Coveningly, you know, whenever I get to to, to that that area, I like to walk to Coveningly. Which way up do you go on Coveningly? Uh, well, this, the way that I tend to go up is to go, go to the Dolranog Road and then past what um, Brian John has created uh, a fictional um, family living in uh, Plassingly. Um, so uh, up towards the left of Cunningley and up to the top and then maybe down the other side then past what, what I don't know the wishing well there's a wishing well further down oh, on the okay. Kilgreen Road so that's that's a round a nice round walk so yeah. so Brian John local a lo author a local author who's um, uh, written books on a fictional family but he uses the names of the properties in the area which is quite interesting for somebody who lives locally yeah. and sometimes he, 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 he'll he say names of characters as well and even though the characters are slightly different you you wonder whether mm, is that so and so <laughs> from so and so because interesting yeah, yeah. yes um so can you describe for me um I know you've mentioned a little bit, but about the, the landscape and the views like from some of the higher um, peaks on the Priscellis. Yeah, the high, well, um, Voile area at the top there, up to on the main road to top of Gwent, and then to the right hand side you walk over to Voile area, and then that's quite an interesting place because because you've got the marker, the, I don't know what they call them, the markers where it says it tells you how many miles Milford Haven is and St David's. It gives you the markers in the landscape. And the landscape, yes, yes yeah. Further away. And, and I think that's quite useful for, well, not to, only for us locals because I take the grandchildren up there and then they can they've got some sort of idea of how big or how small Pembrokeshire is and where these different people from because I think it's important to teach the 
children, you know, again, mm -hmm. of, of their lands yeah. landscape and where they live and how far different places are and have a look at the map and that, that sort of thing. But that's, that's got a beautiful view of the Gwine Valley there. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's quite, yeah, that's, that's one of the favourite walks as well, come to think of it, or the area. Do you believe that the landscape of the uplands, uh, the Sally Hills, has an impact on the way you live at all? Impact on the way? Well, I suppose it does because I, I because I like walking. I mean, I I'm so lucky that I can walk from the house onto the hills. So it does impact on me if if I if I'm feeling it, that I need some headspace. I I can go there. So it. It is helpful um, or um, cathartic, really, to mm. to be able to have an escape without having, you know, not having to walk far or any anything. So it's it does, yeah. I think it's it's the well being. I think our well being is um, is looked after by the hills. Mm, that's a nice way of putting it, actually. Mm. Um, how much do you know about the plants and animals that live on the Presalis? Oh, not much at all. Have you got a, some no. a favourite plant or something that comes out in the spring or something like that that you often see? Anything in the hedgerows? Oh, well, this time of year, I mean, the, I, I think the, the primroses, I mean, the primroses are prolific in this area. I mean, it, you couldn't get a better, you know, walking up to just now, I mean, I've passed, you know, the, the whole hedge is full and further on again it's it, the, the you know that's special and of course you've got um Ticanwell wood as well we walked there the other day and it's so mad it's magical it is really mm. magical and you've got all the um those white flowers of the uh, uh the white um, wooden, enemies. wooden enemies that's right wooden enemies and they're out at the moment um and and you can go to Ticanwell Wood every week and you'd see something different. So the bluebells come up there as well? Yes, not they're not quite up yet. Uh, another few weeks, I would say. Mm. Um, yeah, they, they weren't out last week anyway. So, and that that's beautiful. I mean, you couldn't... You so Ticanwell is nearby and it, woodland then? It's an ancient, um, ancient woodland, um, mostly... Um, Oak, oak, oak woodland, yeah, um, and it's, you know, th there are so many, um, you know, brooks running through, and the moss, mm -hmm. and the lichen. I mean, the the, the 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 amounts of lichen. I mean, I wouldn't know. I mean, I I, I don't know how many different varieties of lichen there are, but uh, I think Ticanwell's probably got all the ones, and also very special ones as well, because I've been told that there's one that's only found in uh, Ticanwell Wood, and it's named after the Dr. Conran, who lived there years ago, and it's called the Conran. So uh, it's like famed it. for its oh, mosses yes. and lichen. Like yeah. and, the, and the fact that the air is so clean here, that's what I've been told, is that the, you know, the lichen are, are prolific there because the air is so clean. So, you know, we are living in such a wonderful part of the country. Mm. The Ticano Wood is, you know, we are so lucky because we, as I said, we've got the Priscelli Hills, we've got the woodland in Ticano, and then we've got the sea as well. So mm. within, you know, five miles, it's just amazing, amazing. Do you do any foraging locally for anything? No, I don't. The um, blackberries. Black, oh, black blackberries and. Um, when the, the mushrooms come out, you know, sort of, as a child, as a child, <laughs> not the magic ones, um, but as a child, we used to um, go out um, mushroom picking with my, in, in my grandpa wow. grandparents' uh, farm. There used to be one particular field that was, you know, the plenty of mushrooms. The field mushrooms. Field mush yeah, field mushrooms, the big, big, big ones. ones, yeah, big ones. Yes, and, and blackberries. Oh yes, I'm I'm a keen blackberry picker. Yeah, I've always got blackberries in the freezer, and I love to have a blackberry and apple pie at Christmas. So I make sure that I go out to blackberry. Okay. So, yeah, uh, slows. I mean, I've made slow gin once or twice. So when the when the slows are out, um, what else? 
uh, garlic as well, wild, wild garlic. garlic. Wild garlic is something that uh, I, what do you I make with that? Well, just chop it up in a in in a salad, and right. you know, just use it for cooking. Um, you can use the flowers as well. So. Mm. Diane, so you, you forage more than you thought well, you yes, did. Well, yes, yeah, I, it's just a natural thing you do. You don't think of it as foraging, really. No. I mean, no. so you, you, it's just something that you've always done, you know. And there's quite a bit of abundance of blackberries and so on oh, yeah. locally then. Yes, yeah, plenty of blackberries, yeah. And slows when, you know, when the year mm -hmm. is good. Damsons as well. Okay. Damsons as well. I mean, I... That was something that I used to do as a child a lot because we had several damson um, trees in, in one of our fields. So come September, that was something that my grandmother used to sort of, come on, let's go and let's take, get, go, get, go and get the damsons. What about so. um, elderflowers? Elderflower, yes, elderflower. Yes, elderflower, that was another um, one, one of my grandmother's recipes then we used to help her get the dump get and the elderflower what did you make with that then well and elderflower wine mm -hmm. but elderflower wine that should we and and that we used to keep for colds and flu it wasn't a, a wine that you used to drink oh. as in you know have have a tipple with our dinner Was it or elderberries anything. then no elderflower oh. elderflower and then you know if we didn't have the flower obviously the berries would come later on and then we would pick the the berries and make another sort of because i've heard that the elderberries are good for cold, cold and yeah yeah on the el el elderflower as well oh. elderflower so yes and she used to keep it then um so that you know it would come winter then we would uh, you know if any of, the f of us would have a cold or flu then oh, have have a bottle of the elderflower or as I say, you know, elder elderberry. But of course if you made the elderflower you wouldn't get the elderberries here. No. Would you? you know, no, you'd have to Yeah. So it was elderflower really. So do people do a lot of foraging locally? But you didn't think that I, you did a lot of foraging, so people probably don't well, think that they I do, do foraging. They do. Yes, yeah. Uh, I do foraging I always try and get blackberries, you know. And, um, I suppose, yeah, people do forage, but not not as much as possibly I used to. Do you think that you used to do a lot more with your parents or grandparents? With my grandparents, I think that's I think that's the era, you know, when, because I did spend a lot of time with one set of grandparents in particular, and my that particular grandfather used to make his own home brew as well. And um, yeah, but uh, yeah, he was quite a homebrew maker. Didn't make so it makes <laughs> make homebrew after anything. Oh well, yes. I mean, he used to experiment. Yeah, experiment. Yeah. <laughs> so, quite a character. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, do you think people perhaps um, from you know older generations knew more about the? The plants and so on just to how, how to make use of them yes I th de definitely yes and, and possibly that even though i i you know elderflower and that sort of thing elderflower mostly and uh, um, mostly um about the medicinal per medicinal uh, um mm. effects of it yeah um yeah i, I think people because because i think they had to because there wasn't the NHS. So you're talking about people who had to look after themselves, really. So I think they looked more to nature for remedies than we do now. We tend to sort of go to the chemist, don't we? So, mm -hmm. um, but people in that generation, like the elderflower, they used to keep it so that you you could drink it, you know, when when it was needed as as a, mm -hmm. a, as a remedy. But I think it's. It's becoming more fashionable now, I suppose, for people to forage and look look at into plants and and their medicinal medicinal effects. So that's come so back around. I think yes, way. yeah. Mm. So what about um, uh, names for plants um, locally? So common common plants now. Are there local names, perhaps in Welsh, um, that we would call things locally? That Mm, oh, I don't know. What do you call uh, a dandelion in Welsh? Uh, Dantelleu. 
I think that's an, an old and vain name is for it. I think I think there's a pro- that's the proper Welsh name for it. I don't think we've. Uh, there might be other people that call it something show. else though. What about uh, foxglove? Um, foxglove is um, bis bisir. Um, what would I call? Bis. Clatchacoon. Clatchacoon. And they'd be served with, they'd be served with. Bisericoon. Bisericoon. Oh, Clatchacoon. Yeah, Clatchacoon. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, so, yeah. there's different names, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, so you don't, yeah, you don't realise. Um, no, d- Clatchacoon. Clatchacoon, I've heard. But, yeah. Um, is, is that the proper Welsh name? There's I different don't know. names. There's different ones. Um, what about Nettles? Dinad. I don't know whether that's the Welsh name for the Dinad. Um, can't think of anything that we'd. Um, uh, Dalgunog, which is what's the Dalgunog? Those round, round um, leaves that you would find in rocky. Like a, uh, a penny. Pennywort. Pennywort. Yeah, Dalgunog, which is Pennywort, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Dalgunog. Um, No, I'm not into but, but, but the names of. The thing is, until you go and look at the hedge and have a look, you yeah. don't realise maybe what is different here. Yeah, to a certain way, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you play any any games with plants or anything? Daisy chain. Daisy chain. <laughs> Daisy chain. Um, and then we used to blow blow. Um, you know, grass, uh, quite wide grass, a couch, not couch grass, that's a, uh, well, a, a rough grass, and yeah. you used to uh, blow into it and it would make a sound. Like a whistle there. Like a whistle. Um, um, what else? Um, yeah, well, my, my, Grandfather used to make whistles out of. Um, it must have been hazel then. It must have been hazel tree. Okay. So he could cut a little groove in it and then make a whistle out of it. Oh right. So I. Wow. Yeah. So have there been any? significant sort of archaeological finds in the area you know as well the very end got lots of archaeology surrounding it well yes because we we've got Pentre Ivan which is well known as we've discussed before um but of course we've got um uh Cry Cross of Elin, which has recently been um discovered as being um the site of where some of the stones from Stonehenge actually came from, which that's 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 quite an important part. Which it, it attracts a lot of archaeological tourists, mm. um, which is which is good and bad because people do respect the proper the people who are, are really interested in archaeology will respect the place. But then you get the tourists who don't respect the place and start taking chips of the stone away and that sort of thing. So the area, yes, it is important and we must share it with people, but we've got to be careful how we share things that are so valuable, not only to us, but to the whole country, really. I mean, it's it's a, a remarkable find and a discovery. Um, and then, of course, we've got recently um, uh, Mike Parker Pearson, Professor Mike Parker Pearson, has been making archaeological disc- um, archaeological work on um, Wine Mound, which is again part of the Bracelles, where they found um, a, a, um, ancient circle of stones mm. and seen, you know, that that's an important site. Again, you know, we, we must be careful how we market it and how we share share our um, wealth of archaeological sites here. Mm. So do a lot of people then come because of the archaeology? 
I think they 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 have in the recent years since Crankle's rebellion has been um, discovered and and it's been on the television. You know, it's there's been several programs on the television about it, and I think that the far more people have come to the area because of that. Mm. Um, and yes, it is it's it's important for us, but but we've got to sort of be careful how the tourists um you see the site these sites you know they're not the sites to be respected mm. and, that, and that's got to be um i think the national park have got to work along with the archaeological society in pembrokeshire to make sure that the the these um places are um respected and cared for as well mm. going back to thinking about um, this area being uh, very strongly uh, agricultural yeah um, are there any practices from the area um, that, that no longer happen here in terms of farming how has farming changed um, on the hills do you think you mentioned the, the farms have, have got bigger have they farms have got bigger and um, I suppose the the land because f farms have got bigger because smaller farming units have dispersed. I mean, they because the houses have been sold separate to the land. So uh, there are few farmers who have got more land, and and whether the Priscelli's is is used as much now as it was say 50 years ago because at where i live i mean we we've got um permission to graze five sheep and three cows or something on 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 the Priscelli's, but of course we haven't got any any uh, animals so so i think because as, as the landowners have got better land they possibly use less of the of the mountain, um, and then does that create a problem? I I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not well versed on farming practices, but uh, w whether because there are less less uh, sheep on on the moors, that maybe there's more um, wild uh, growth there and. So because because it's not grazed as much as it was, whether that the fa you know farming practices on the Priscelli has changed in the last fifty years, I I would say, but I I I don't know how. So, talking about extra growth, you know, do they do anything to maintain that growth in terms of fires and things? Well, yes, they do. They do burn the the mountain. Um, there are a couple of months, I think, that from. Uh, oh, November to March or something like that. I'm not quite sure the mon uh, mm. months, but yes, yeah, so they're allowed to sort of burn it so that you've got fresh um, grass coming for the for for the the animals for the sheep mostly. Mm. Then you don't get many horses out there now as as you used to. I don't think, but um, yes, and it's that's a tradition that's been going on for years and years and years. I mean, that's I think that's created you know with the biodiversity groups you know sort of be, being more um uh, more of people being concerned about di biodiversity in the area there c can be a conflict between the farmers because this is something this is a tradition they've always mm. they've always done this is this is part of living in the Briseli hills but, but some people uh, don't feel uh, don't feel feel happy about it happening. No, I, I think there is some sort of um, different views about what should and shouldn't be done onto the Bracelets. Yeah. And possibly, you know, we have got climate change. Things do change. You know, we, we don't get the um, the the. Um, we don't get the gnats and the, mm. 
um, things do yes things things have changed and and I think people have got to come together and work out together what needs to be, be happening to the mm. Priscillis as opposed to sort of being two separate entities and sort of um, working against each other they should be working together and um, are there any sort of songs or poems about the Priscilla and life in it that you know about songs and uh no is, is the Priscilla area so. well known for poetry and so oh on? Yeah, yes there's a the, the the one that comes to mind is the um uh Mohindi is the and don't ask me to sing it because I don't know the <laughs> words. Um, there's there is a po there's a, a song about the uh, a, a, um, a pig being killed, um, and the 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 black the, pig. Is it, it called Mochindi? Mochindi, yeah, Mochindi. So that's um, that that was written in the Preseli area. Was it? Yes, and from Keldin apparently. That's where where the mm. And that's become a famous song in Wales. Well, I don't know whether it's been a famous song in Wales or whether it's possibly a famous song in this area. I'm not quite sure how far it, 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 it goes, is it? I'm not sure. What about are there, is, are there any sort of um, significant poets or anything? Well, Waldo Williams is, is a, a, a prolific um, poet and, mm -hmm. and he's got a... Um, Memorial. A memorial on the uh, the other side of the mountain, which is the the Monachlog the side of the mountain. Yeah, and and the Blue Arrow Evans as well. He's he's um, of of Priscilla. Mm. Um. So, how has you know changes in food and attitudes towards food? Do you do you grow your own food? Did you did your parents grow their own? food as in potatoes and so on is that yeah my per my my father was a keen gardener so yes he 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 was really you know we had potatoes and peas and all sorts of you know everything carrots and your cabbage and everything um now he hasn't really given me the he hasn't said he hasn't sort of hasn't passed down, down the, skills. these skills to me at all I mean, I, I I have tried, but I haven't succeeded really. Um, I don't I don't know what it is. I'm not no, I'm not a keen gardener. But do people? Um, I think do a lot locally with growing their own food still. I think a lot of people who've moved into the area are far more efficient about growing their own food than people who have been here for years. You know, and maybe that is the um, attraction to to places like this where they've got some land. And they do want to make you know produce their own food, which I think is something that we must be looking looking at in the future. You know, it it isn't as easy. You know, it isn't as easy, and it isn't as we don't know where our food is coming from. Possibly our vegetables and what insecticides and everything is going being put on on um, vegetables and fruit that we buy in the supermarket or whatever. And and I think maybe that's going to be more of a trend in the future for people to to grow their own food. So do people like to shop locally if they can? Then I think a lot of people. It's more. It there's more people. There are more people looking at where their food is coming from now, as opposed to say ten years ago. I think with with all different ailments that we're, we're experiencing now I mean uh, is it in, in our food chain and you know there's a lot of uh, um, research gone into you know what we're eating and, and people are more conscious about what what you know the advantages of of, of um, growing our own food mm -hmm. and and the and the miles as well that you know our carbon footprint you know we we've, we've got to look at the whole whole thing very differently really and you know the Priscilla Hills are, are an ideal area to, you know, it's an ideal area to grow our own food really and there's Obviously. lots of great local producers for oh yes yeah meat and, meat, meat, and, and, yeah, meat and far more people are, are selling their milk from from the farm now you know I've gone to one you know only this week you know and, and a fairly new one and it, it it is better I think for all of us so that we 
we are eating um, we know what, where our food com comes mm. from and we have got the opportunity of, of doing that in this area mm. with meat, vegetables, milk So moving on then um, what do you feel are the uh, main sort of challenges for this area into the future? Main challenges, right. Um, I think because we've got people moving into the area constantly and as I've said before we we should be welcoming them but making them aware that they are moving into another country, another language, everyday language, another culture. Uh, what we've got is very precious and we do want to share it with other people but we want to share it in a in a not a controlled way but a, a measured way um so what was the question again quite what's uh, challenges. What challenges right so that that's one of the main challenges is is to sort of make people who, who moved into the area be aware of 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 that of the, of the fact that we are different and that they've moved into a, a Welsh speaking area. That's that's mm -hmm. important. They could move into Pembrokeshire, South Pembrokeshire, Milford Haven. They wouldn't know that they were in Wales probably because they wouldn't hear the language. But here it's important that people move who move into this special area that they are moving into a, a Welsh speaking area uh, where the culture is is you know is, is a strong cultural feel feel to the place. Um, so is, it, so is there a challenge there to to keep the language alive as well? Is it under threat? It's certainly under th under under threat as far as I'm concerned, because um, because people don't because we tend to to speak English because people the English people move into the area. People aren't going to hear the Welsh language as often, mm. and this is why. It's so brilliant that we've started a Welsh speaking Welsh class here only recently. So, so, so as I've said before, it's our responsibility as Welsh speaking people to um, keep the language alive and to encourage people mm -hmm. to to learn the language. That's one of the challenges, and you know, it, it is a challenge for people like me who've got you know we I've got family, I've got parents, I've got grandchildren, children, so I've got to spread my my time mm -hmm. within my family as well as helping people who have moved into the area you know i'm i mean i'm lucky i'm i'm retired but it's not as easy as that for people for people who are who have got their own children they're bringing up their own children now so it, it is a, a something that i think everybody should be part of and be aware that we m m must help these people who have moved into the area that's one of the challenges the other challenge is is um the fact that we are a, a, a tourist area but we haven't got the infrastructure to 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 invite and to encourage masses of people to come into the area. You know, we it, it's a, it's a farming area, as I said, the tractors. You know, things. It, it's it, we haven't got the the main roads and people and and the car parking spaces and things like that. It's so very rural, isn't it? It's yeah. very rural, and 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 it's it's we we've got to have the balance right. People are reliant on. Um, Airbnb or bed and breakfast for their possibly main income in in some cases, and we've got to make sure that they they are provide you know they they can can live here and, and can make a good living from 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 tourism, but it, it's it's a fine line to 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 make sure that we we're, we're um, keeping um, keeping the area as pristine as as it is now, and. Um, not not creating more problems by mm. by in, by encouraging too many visitors, and we you know we've got to have the visitors who respect this area, and and I think mostly people do because if people come to this area, they come come walking really walking the Bruselli Hills or walking the um, public you know the the coastal footpath, 
so we, we you know we don't want sort of um maintaining main, the balance then, we, it? it's maintaining it and, and and it is i think that's a major challenge moving moving forward into the future where everybody has to have a, a slice you know a, a slice of the pie sort of thing mm -hmm. really isn't it so just to close then is there anything that um that uh, i haven't asked you about that you'd like to mention about living in the Caselli? anything at all that you think is worth mentioning no i think i've gone on <laughs> too long as it is no i think it's no, I, I, I think we've covered um, almost everything here. Yeah. I think we've got... Well, thank you very much, Sandra. Do you want to go on? No, I don't want to go on.